Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DxO webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and today I'm going to be taking you on an exploration of night, evening, low light photography type of a thing. It's going to be fun. We got a few images to go through. We're going to be focusing on the Nick collection. Based off of previous feedback, I'm going to be focusing on just a few images, not going to be uh, I'm not gonna be going into tons of images. We're gonna spend a little bit more time on each one. The first thing that I'm going to do, the first image I'm gonna work with is this photo here from a very, very tall building in Tokyo. Now you might be wondering why on earth is the image so crooked? Who would take a picture like this? And let me explain why this is shot this way. This is actually a pretty long exposure. I mean, here you see right here, it's a full two second exposure. And you can tell that because of the whooshing lights of the cars down below on here. And the reason it's at an angle is because I didn't have a tripod. So this photo was shot with the camera propped as best as I could possibly crop it in the environment that I had, which meant not keeping it straight. The thing is that I knew that I'd be able to fix that in post. So just one of those little tips, if you're going to do some type of a long exposure photo and you don't have a tripod, don't worry about keeping the camera totally straight. That's an easy thing to fix in post. If the camera shakes, that's a little bit harder to fix in post. So put the camera somewhere where it's at an angle and uh, and let it be. Now, the one of the first questions I'm gonna do in here is to fix these reflections. If you look closely up here, you can see some odd, some dots up here, some strange lines in here. For all I know, that might be my shoulder. This is probably the bar between one of the windows. I don't really know, but this was shot through glass at night. So we are definitely getting some reflections in here. So I'm just gonna clean those up really quick to begin with. Also, oops, zoom back out. Also, probably going to do a little bit of exposure adjustment on here before taking this into um, into the color correction or the the next phase of this. So let's just start with the basic retouching. To do that, I will go into the develop module and go into a little bit of retouching. We're going to use the healing in here, and I'm not going to be super super careful about this just because we don't want to spend all day doing retouching, but I'm going to do some basic retouching here just to get rid of this. So really kind of the reason that I'm doing this is just again to drive that point home that sometimes you can do a photo knowing that you're going to have to make corrections to it. And that's perfectly fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, let's see, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger and get some of this across the top there, which gets some kind of weird stuff going on. I think that looks pretty good. It's good enough for this. Um, I'll get rid of these little spots on here. Get rid of those, 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 and those. And I think, is that a spot on my screen or is that a spot on the photo? That one's on my screen. Okay, so that's it. So that's all I'm gonna do there. Again, I could be more careful about it, could be better about it. But really the point here is to illustrate that you can do some of these corrections without, uh, oh, sorry, you can take the picture knowing that you are going to eventually do these corrections and not make that a concern. So again, I think it's just something really useful to, to consider. All right, so let's do some basic adjustment. I, I do want the photo to be dark like this, so I'm probably not gonna do a whole lot in here. I tend to like to go into things like the exposure slider and drag that up and down just to see what is in there. And if I lift it up a bit, we'll see, well, first of all, I didn't do the cleanest job up here, but that's okay. We'll see that there's, I'm going to call it a lot of shadow detail that I don't want in this photo. So I'm probably not going to pull too much of this stuff up in here. I'm going to leave it down. Let's we'll reset that. Maybe I'll lift it up a little bit. And the way that I usually prefer to do exposure adjustments is to use the tone curve. This allows me to bring up the mid tones a little bit while protecting the highlights. Maybe go down to the shadows and bring those up separately from the mids. And I'm going to bring them up just a little bit, not a whole lot, but we're going to go right about there. Okay. I'm going to call that my starting point. So now let's get into fixing the image, getting the, the perspective corrected. Now in Lightroom, I can of course easily straighten this out, but because I'm so high up and I'm kind of looking down, I want to do a little bit of perspective correction on these buildings as well. And so I'm actually going to use the Nick Collection tool called, where are we? Here we go called perspective effects to do that. This is the newest tool in the Nick Collection bunch. And this is going to allow me to not only straighten out this image, but do quite a bit of correction to it and really get a full preview of this of this image with all of its correction before applying it, before committing to it. Now, one of the things that's going on here is we're seeing up in the corner under the distortion, the automated distortion has not identified the file that this came from. I think this has to do with because it came through Lightroom, some of the metadata got stripped by Lightroom and so Perspective Effects doesn't know what this photo is. 
But the cool thing here is that you actually have a way to fix that. It just tells you open the original image and there's a little thing in here, why does it need that? But we're gonna go ahead and find that original photo, which is, let me make sure that's the right one. I believe this is it, yep, that's it. Select that and it identifies the camera, the lens and applies the proper correction to it. So now if I turn this on and off, you can see a slight amount of correction that has been done automatically uh, based off of that profile. So that's all in, all in place now and we're ready to go to the next step. So the next step is going to be to, to fix this, Horizon fix the distortion. I could do them separately, I'm gonna go ahead and try doing this all at once. Now this is, and I picked this image on purpose, this is gonna be a complicated picture to, to do because I don't have really solid vertical lines to go off of. I mean, I, I kind of do on this building, but man, they're gonna be hard to see. I have a solid horizontal line. The horizon there is really, really obvious, but I don't have a bottom horizontal line. So this is, this is gonna be tricky, but that's okay. I like a challenge. So I'm gonna grab the four way or the eight point perspective correction tool. If you haven't seen this before, by the way, you've got, actually I should just run through these. Um, you can do auto, which on this image, it's really not gonna know what to do because this image is so all over the place. If we were just correcting vertical distortion, I could grab the vertical lines here and set these against the building. So I would set them, I'm not doing it very accurate right now, but I would basically set them like this to be accurate against those. And that would per, that would correct that part of it, the vertical part, but that's not gonna fix the horizontal. I could go horizontal only, line these up to the horizon line. But again, that wouldn't fix the vertical part of it, or let's just reset it. I can do a single square. So if I have a, this is useful. Like, let's say this building right here was the one I was I was straightening it off of where I've got a solid square or rectangle. I could use that. But again, the one that I use the most and the most flexible one is this 8.1 where each one of these lines are completely independent. So I'm going to grab the first horizontal line that I know that one's easy. And then let's grab some of the vertical lines and we're going to put these first just very quickly along the edges of the building, and then I'm gonna get more close to it and pay more attention. So let's see here. This is the tricky part on a photo like this, is identifying the edges all the way around. So that one's pretty easy, that's obvious. And then I follow that edge up, and it's kind of funny if you follow, this is a trick to do this, by the way, take your mouse down and start just following the edge of the building. Because this building might have little pieces of it that are jutting out, and I want to make, or jutting in, and I want to make sure that I do not end up aligning it incorrectly. So here's the top of that primary part of the building. Notice, and I can't move the mouse to point at it because then it would move the whole thing. But if you look to the right of the cursor, you can see how the building continues to climb. If I wasn't paying attention, I might have aligned this right here, and then that would not be right. So I need to make sure that I'm aligning it correctly. So I'm gonna get it just on the edge of the building there. Notice under the circle, it says press shift to slow cursor. So I'll hold the shift key down. That allows me a little bit more precise movement of the cursor, and I'm going to call that good enough, and that has lined up that line. Now let's do this next one here. Once again, I need to find the edge of the building. There's that outer edge right there. We call that good and take a look here. And once again, I'm gonna do the same trick, go down to the bottom of that building there, follow it up. And actually here, now that's gonna be trickier because I can see this building juts out and then juts in. So maybe what I'll do is go a little bit higher up the building and then we'll go the other way down. This one has a lot of steps in it. So I'm gonna go right about there and then bring it into right about there. And I'm gonna call that the, the stepping point. I think that's about right. Now this bottom line, the last one, this is definitely a guess. So at this point, I'm going to put it roughly where I think it might be. And I'm kind of basing that off of the shape of the building here, looking for something that looks square right there. And then I'll just hit preview and see what we get out of it. And if I don't like it, and actually that worked out just fine, but if I didn't like it, I could move this line hit preview again and re-correct that. But I think where it was was actually pretty good. So let's just drop that back into place. Like so, we've got a nice clean horizon across the top. You can see the distortion that's happening. And this is just fascinating to see. Look at the photo and how it's being distorted out on the bottom of the image here. Uh, the top up here is being pulled out. This edge of it is pulled way out here. It's just wild to see how that all gets pulled around. But the end result is this straightened image. I mean, it's kind of an impossible photo at this point because you could never be standing straight up, pointing the camera straight ahead at this altitude, at this height and get this photo, but we've just made it. So, you know, 
that's kind of cool. It's nice to be able to do things like this. It would be otherwise impossible. I, I, it's one of the fun things about playing with perspective effects, creating those views that would otherwise not be possible. All right, let me save this. This is going to bring us back over to Lightroom. And then from here, once that renders out, we're going to jump into Color Effects Pro. So here we go. Wait, just a second here. And you can do it, Lightroom. One of the world's fastest computers. And Lightroom's still just taking its time. Come on. Oh, I'm going to take a look over the questions while we're waiting for that. Has anything come up yet? Nothing's come up yet. Ah, there we go. It has finally finished. Okay, so there's the end result of that. Looking good. Let's get some, let's do some color work on it. So I'm going to right click on this again, edit in. I'm going to take this into Color Effects Pro and choose to edit a copy. That's fine. Very good. Let's set this to Adobe RGB. Make sure I got the full color space and jump into the editor. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is play a little bit more with the, let's clear all this out. So I'm starting from scratch. Uh, play a little bit more with the exposure. It's Obviously, it's dark. That's how I brought it in here. But I'm kind of feeling at this point like maybe I want to brighten this up a little bit. So I'm going to try that. I'm going to start by adding, where are we? I'm going to want levels and curves. Let's find that in here. Probably under L. There it is, levels and curves. And I'm going to pull that curve up just a little bit. I don't want to go too high. You bring it up just a little bit to add a little bit more light into the shadow area here. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, that's good. If I turn this on and off, we can see the before and after. You can also see the before and after by holding down the compare button. But just another little tip here, by turning these on and off here, you'll see as we add more adjustments, this way you can toggle individual controls as opposed to going all the way back to the beginning. Next up, I like an image that's got a bit of a, a kind of a mysterious glow to it, if you will. And in prepping for this, I was playing with a bunch of different adjustments. And one of the ones that I will often go to to start is the fog adjustment, but this is just too much for this image. This fog filter tends to work better on images that are already bright, but because this one's so dark, it's making the whole thing bright, and that just really doesn't work for this one. But this is the beauty of this workflow. You can go through and try different adjustments, just click on a different one. There's even a graduated fog. So, you know, if you wanted that kind of fog in the distance look, you could do something like that. But I know that for this, the one that I like is Glamour Glow. And the funny thing about Glamour Glow is based off the name, you would think this is really ideal for portraits. And, and I suppose it is. It's great for portraits. But I really like the way that this treats lights. So I'm going to take the glow way up on here, take the saturation up to bring some of that color in, and add a little bit of warmth into it as well. And let's maybe a little bit more on the glow. Yeah, it's got a little bit more in there, a little bit more saturation. And we're really getting this nice blooming image with all the lights in here. Now, at this point, it is definitely getting darker. If I toggle this on and off, notice the whole image got darker in there. So this is a good time to go back to levels and curves. And now with the Glamour Glow already applied, start to play with those levels. Remember that this adjustment is happening before the Glamour Glow. The pipeline, the image pipeline, if you will, cascades through these, like gravity. It goes through the top adjustment first, and then it goes to the next adjustment, and then on and on and on. So if I had, let's just say that, let me cancel that, let me delete that one. Let's just say that I started with the Glamour Glow, and I hadn't adjust, added any levels to it. And I'm looking at this going, okay, I'm, I like the direction it's going, but it's too dark. So then I add another filter, and I go to my levels and curves. Oh, here we go, levels and curves. And I make an adjustment here. It might well work. However, I am making this adjustment after that glow. And I would rather, just for the image processing pipeline, I would rather have this happen before the glow. So I'm going to move this up beforehand. And you can already see the difference. I mean, in fact, that's kind of cool. If I drag this back and forth, you see there's a pretty big difference in there. Here, I don't need as much of a correction to get that same look. And so I'm going to adjust it here prior to that status in the pipeline. So I kind of like that. I think that looks pretty good in there. All right, so we're getting somewhere here. Maybe a little bit brighter, maybe a little bit more in the shadows. Nah, let's not get carried away. I think I'll leave it like that. Next up, I'm digging the warmth down here. I'm digging the coolness up here. It's gotten a bit too bright, so I'm going to want to do something about that. One of the, because of this kind of warmth that I'm feeling in here, but it's really only in the street area there, I want to have a little bit more warmth over the whole thing. and where my mind is going is towards a bicolor filter, where I can have one color at the top and a different color at the bottom. 
So I'm going to load up by color user defined. Let's make sure we create a new filter holder first. So there I've got my levels and curves, then glamour glow, and then an empty filter. So we're gonna add by color user defined. This will allow me to adjust the color so I can make the top any color that I wanted in here. Um, although actually I think that blue at the top is probably gonna be fine. The lower color, I think I'm gonna go a little bit more orange on there. And now it's a case of finding the transition point and then dialing this back so it doesn't look ridiculous like it does right now. So there's a, imagine if you will, in fact, if I take, let's see the opacity all the way up, we'll be able to see this a little bit more easily. Um, imagine if you will, that there is a line somewhere between here going from blue to this orange color at the bottom. And as I move this vertical shift, I can see where that line lies. And I actually, it's actually pretty well placed up there near the top. So I'm gonna drop that there. Let's take the opacity down a little bit. We don't want this to be so, so obvious. We want this to be a little bit more subtle. And see, in this case, I don't need to play with rotation. I kind of think it's actually pretty good right there. It's a little bit too purple. I'm gonna make this color a little bit darker. We can see the preview color down there. It's kind of a darkish purple on there. There we go. And it's still a little bit too much. Let's drag the whole thing back a little bit. And I kind of like it. I kind of like it. Now, if I wanted to further darken the sky, there's a couple ways I could go about doing that. I think I will do this by adding another empty filter and let's add a, uh, we're gonna add the levels and curves again to this. So where are we under L for levels and curves? Here we go, I probably should mark some of these as favorites. And I'm gonna pull my highlights down, but I only want those to apply to the sky. So I'm gonna use my control points. I'm gonna drop a control point right there on the sky. And I do want to make sure that I'm applying this really only to the sky area. So I'm gonna go into the control point mask and turn that on. And we can see here that because the image is so dark overall, any mask that I create up here is going to get a lot of the image. So what I'm probably gonna do instead is create multiple control points by option dragging these across. Let's grab a couple of them in here like so. And then I'm gonna grab a negative control point and drop it down here on the bottom, make that really nice and big. Probably do a couple of those actually. Let's put one right about there. And another one right about there. There we go. And let's see, I could probably clean this up a little bit more. I think that's probably pretty good. We can see a little bit of waving in there, but I think once we disable the masks, we're not gonna see any of that. And there we go, now I can se separate that out. There we go, and darken that sky nicely. I like it. I mean, it's a little bit fantasy land, it's a little bit wild and crazy, but I kind of dig it. So if we go and look at the compare to the original, that's where we started, and that's where I ended up. And you know, I like it. I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna hit save and call that image done. All right, let me turn the camera on and jump over to the questions that are coming in and see what you guys are asking. Where is this photo taken? So it's in Tokyo. I forget the name of the building. It's one of the tallest buildings in Tokyo. It is, they have an observation tower. I mean, it's a, you, know, you probably pay, I don't remember now, you go up there and you know, you see kind of 360 degree views around the city. Um, some strange noises coming from outside. Uh, 360 degree view around the city. I just, I don't remember the name of the building. I'm sorry. I don't think, yeah, I don't have a, any metadata on there to tell me, um, but it's Tokyo. Sorry. Those three buildings there are pretty iconic and known. I, I just don't know what they were called. Sorry. Um, second question. On the first image, after correcting the perspective, the horizon line has a barrel distortion. distortion. I guess you're right. It does. Yeah, that totally could be fixed. Um, should would have done that earlier. Um, let's see here. It would be a little, you might risk distorting the bottom of the buildings a little bit because that is kind of an artificially induced barrel distortion almost because of the correction that's happened in there. Typically, if you were just dealing with a straight image that started that way, you absolutely have barrel distortion that you could fix. I think here it might do a little distortion on the bottom of the image. So I would probably choose to leave it as it is. I kind of, and so there's the answer to your questions. You can, it might affect the bottom. Personally, looking at the photo, I kind of like that little slight distortion. It gives you that idea of just how high up you are. You know, when you look out at the horizon, you, if you see some bending to it, you're like, whoa, I'm really high. That's kind of, um, it's kind of how I see that. But but yeah, I mean, certainly you could if, if that's what you wanted to do. Uh, next, is it better to address noise reduction prior to color effects? 
I think that there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, it depends on what you're going to do. Noise reduction often should be handled in the beginning because a lot of other adjustments you make to it might enhance the noise reduction. But I would say, especially if you're working from a raw base like you would be in Lightroom to do your, your retouching first, although if you're doing noise reduction in Lightroom, that would be part of it. If you were going to be sending this through to um, out to a photo lab to do the noise reduction, then at that point, the noise reduction actually gets applied on export. So let me think through the process. You would do your base images. You would be exporting it out technically as a TIFF before you apply the noise reduction. Uh, I, I'm sorry, before you apply the filters. So yeah, I think that that would make sense in that case. You would apply the noise reduction before taking it into the filters. Um, it's definitely one of those things that there is no absolute right or wrong answer. And I think, like I said, that would be my first inclination would be to get rid of the noise first and then go into the creative. But if you found that it just wasn't working or somehow you were reintroducing noise you'd already gotten rid of, then I would try doing it the other way around and do the noise reduction later on in the process at the end of the process. That's kind of how I would um, I would likely approach that. Yeah. Great question, though. Great question. Again, no single answer for that, but um, but that's where I'd go. Okay, next question. What is the difference in adjusting the global exposure and playing with separate cursors such as highlight shadows, black and whites? Ah, okay, that's a that's quite a uh, base level question, but I'm happy to do that. Let me see. Um, looking at my photos to see if one of these would be a really good demo for that. Actually, yeah. The next picture. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I will answer that question with the next photo. I will add this in. Let me look at my notes and figure out exactly how to incorporate that. Um, yeah, actually. No, that's perfect. I will. I was going to do a little bit of that on the next photo anyway, but I will I will elaborate on that on the next photo. OK, great. Let's see, any other questions right now? Nope. OK. Pardon me. All right, let's um, grab a sip of water and then let's get into it again. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, let me turn off the camera. Moving on to the next photo. This one is in New York City. This is shot, again, from a tall building. Um, a fun little story here. This is for a commercial shoot that I was on. We rented this apartment that had these incredible views for the shoot, and this is uh, one of the views. Clearly, <laughs> it's kind of okay. So from here, it's a little bit on the dark side. I really exposed for the sky here, which looks beautiful, but I do want to bring some more light into the buildings in here. And there is a little bit of a crookedness to the photo, not terrible, nothing that is so bad that I'm going to want to bring it into perspective effect. So I'm just going to go ahead and do the basic correction for this here in Lightroom. Just go to transform. I'm going to do a full auto and that's it. So it's a tiny, tiny amount of adjustment that's been done there. And that works perfectly fine here. I think for a lot of simpler adjustments, it's fine to do it here. It's those really crazy ones like the first image where you want to go into perspective effects where you can really take advantage of that. All right, so now I want to play with the exposure on this. Let's start with the base exposure slider. As I've said, as I said earlier today, and as I've said many times before, I tend to like to just grab the exposure slider and drag it up and down just to see what I've got in here. And by doing this, I can see that there is a remarkable amount of detail in the foreground in here. I mean, look at these buildings, look at all the details showing up in here. This is pretty good. It's quite noisy at this point because I've really, really lifted that up, but there is a lot going on in here. However, I don't want all of that to show up, but it's nice to know that the data is there. Conversely, I can go the other way, bring it down and see just how rich and dark the sky can look. And by doing that, I can see really some of the extra colors that are in here. But honestly, the way that I expose it to begin with, I think that the sky looks really good. Now, this exposure slider is a global exposure. Your highlights and shadows are all moving together. And if you look at the histogram, you can see as I move this back and forth how the entire image is getting darker, the entire image is getting brighter. And following the histogram whenever making any adjustment in here is a great way to not only keep track of what you're doing, but to also really understand what the tool does. So in this regard, again, exposure adjusts everything. Then you have your highlight shadows, black and white points. And the highlights are going to focus just on the highlights. So don't look at the image right now, just look at the histogram. You can see how my shadows are left alone, the darker parts of the image are left alone, but I'm just adjusting the highlight. I'll go the other direction, grab the shadow tool and drag that back and forth. And you can see it's just the shadows that are being adjusted. So it's leaving the highlight area alone, the highlight one leaves the shadows alone. The exposure slider moves everything together. 
So this is a really powerful difference between those sliders. Now the white and the black point is effectively, think of white the same as highlights, except that it's only the very, very top, and black the same as shadows, except it's only the very, very bottom, the very darkest parts of it. So now as I move that black point, you can see it's just that darkest edge. And of course, you know, if I go, especially if I go too far, you see a lot of other data get pulled. It's thinking of it like silly putty. You can only pull this so far before it's gonna start pulling the rest of it in. But you are really just adjusting that darkest black level or the brightest white level and everything else is forced to fall in line with it. But you can see how the other end of the, uh, of the histogram is not being affected. So with all that in mind, I look at this image and I think, well, what do I want to do to change it? Do I want to affect the overall exposure? No, because I like the overall exposure. It's just some particular parts of the image that need enhancement. Do I want to affect the highlights? Well, no, because I like the bright parts of the image, the sky. I don't want those to be any brighter. If I brought those up to get them brighter, I would lose some of that richness in the color in here. So I don't want to do that. And I don't want to make them darker because I kind of like the color exposure that they were. So I'm going to leave that alone. Do I want to adjust the shadows? And that is where I want to make some adjustments. Not a whole lot, but I want to pull just a little bit more into the shadows in here. So there we can see I've really just lifted this up a little bit. I'm not reintroducing a huge amount of noise like we had seen earlier when I took the exposure way, way up. I'm just bringing a little bit into that. Next up, I'm going to play with something called clarity, just to add a little bit more texture, if you will, um, into the image. So that's under the present slider, bring up clarity, and that's going to really pop that up a little bit. Now, this is one of those sliders, if you're a Lightroom user, that you do have to be careful of. You can really get um, crazy in here. <laughs> you can you can bring this up and make it look um, like the kind of image that someone looks at and says, oh, you've just discovered the clarity slider. So be aware of this. Don't Don't get carried away in here. Now, I am actually going to overdo this a little bit because I know that the step that I'm going to take this into is going to be black and white, which sounds crazy. Why would I do that? I got this beautiful colored sky in here, but I kind of think this is going to make a neat black and white image. I mean, there's only one way to find out, right? And that's to play with it, but that's what I would do. Now, if I wasn't going black and white, I would probably bring up the saturation a bit. I mean, that's, <laughs> okay, that's a bit too much. Uh, bring up saturation a little bit because that is really pretty, um, but that's not what I want. I'm not going to do that because I am going to, believe it or not, turn this into a black and white image. So to go back to the clarity, the reason that I brought it up as far as I did, it was because I do want a lot of separation between the bright and the dark points, mainly all these little points of light in here. I want a lot of separation in there to really make that stand out when I go black and white. So with that said, right click, um, edit in, and we're going to take this into Silver FX Pro 2. Again, I think this is probably not your default go-to thing to think of for an image like this, but I encourage you, if, if you like black and white, I personally love black and white, if you like black and white, then take images that you wouldn't naturally just think of as clear, obvious black and white contenders and, um, and see what you can get out of it. You know, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you play with it and you go, yeah, no, never mind. I'm gonna go back to color but you might find yourself surprised at how many images do really, really well as black and white. Okay, so the first thing I'll do in here is play with presets. You've got a bunch of different presets in here, um, and it's just a good idea, I think, to go through them. It lets you know exactly what you're gonna do. Go through them and just see what you've got in here. You might find things about the image that you didn't already know. Now, just in case you're not already familiar with SilverFX Pro 2, let me give you a brief tour of how this interface works. It's a bit different than ColorFX Pro that we were in before. Here in SilverFX, you have, first of all, a series of presets over here on the left. We've got categories, modern, um, en vogue, classic, and so on, and then there's just an all, and it just shows you all of them. Any one of these presets that you load, I'm just gonna grab one here, will make a series of adjustments over here on the right. Unlike with ColorFX, where you had a series of filters on the left that you dragged into the right or added to the right, here, all of the adjustments are applied all of the time. So you have, if we collapse these down here, just to see all the categories, You've got global adjustments, which as you might guess from the name, will affect the entire image. So brightness, contrast, and structure for the entire image. However, pay attention, these little triangles in here disclose to show quite a lot more than you might have initially thought. So even under structure, you have highlight midtones and shadow separate sliders, and then a fine structure for getting, getting into those really nitty gritty details. Contrast, same thing. You've got amplified whites, blacks, and a soft contrast slider. Brightness, you've got highlights, midtones, shadows, and, and dynamic brightness. Now, 
I'm not going to go through every single slider in here. I've actually done courses, done webinars on SilverFX Pro exclusively. So if you really want to learn more about black and white, I encourage you to check those out. But for now, let's just uh, let's just go through the rest of what the sliders are in here. So there's the global. Here's selective adjustments. So if you want to do something to a specific area, that's this. And the only thing you have under here to begin with is a control point. And I'll just show you this. It's interesting when I add a control point here. At first drop, you've only got three sliders, brightness, contrast, and structure. But if you click this little triangle, it reveals even more. So amplify whites, amplify blacks. And you can think of that as kind of a white and black point slider. Find structure and then selective colorization if you want to bring some color back into the image from the source. You can do that. So these are your selective adjustments. When you want to apply an adjustment to a very specific area, this is the tool that you would use for that. Then you've got color filters, which if you are familiar with black and white film photography, simulate what it would look like if you were to put a red filter, orange filter, and so on over the camera lens while shooting. If you go into the details in here, you can make your own, you can actually design your own color filter. And then film types, actually I'll come back to that. Finishing adjustments is things like color toning, vignetting, burning out the edges of a photo, um, adding a border to the photo. You can do things like this in here, which is kind of Come here, you. there we go. Kind of cool if you want to add a little border onto that. So that's all well and good. Those are, again, finishing touches. But the real power in here is under film types. Now, at first glance, you pull this up and you go, okay, there's a bunch of cool film types presets that I can work with. And I choose, you know, if I want to make it look like it was shot on Agfa APX 400, cool. If I want to make it look like it was shot with, uh, I don't know, a Polaroid film stock, cool. And these are all very meticulously designed to simulate to emulate those actual real world films, which is kind of neat. So you've got these, but all of these are effectively presets of all of this. And under here is an immense amount of control. And again, I, I'm not going to go deep into SilverFX Pro, but you have an absolutely incredible amount of control in here from the the curve, the uh, dynamic response of an image and of the film grain and how that's going to look, how individual colors are handled the grain structure that's in there is just so much in here and these sliders right here these sensitivity sliders is one of the most powerful kind of hidden things inside of silverfx pro so here's what i'll do i'm going to reset actually i, I did tell you i was going to go through some presets so I'll, I'll i'll do that in a moment what i will do for the main edit though is i'm going to start with this neutral preset and then tune the image by simply adjusting the colors here. This is adjusting the colors of the original source and basically adjusting the brightness in black and white of that original color, if that makes sense. So that said, let me just go through a few presets real quick just to see what things look like. So here's one called overexposed, high contrast. It just gives you some idea of what things you can do in here. This high structure is kind of cool. It really, I mean, look at all that texture and detail that's coming through in there. Um, Let's see here what else we've got that looks kind of cool. Low key looks pretty cool, really dark and moody. What's interesting too is I'm playing with these. Oh, I like that one. Uh, you notice the sky here, how dark that's gotten. If I compare back to the base black and white. So when we hit compare here, we're not seeing the original color. We're seeing the original black and white conversion, flat black and white conversion. You can see that it is darker in that corner, but some of these adjustments really drive that home and take that darker area and make it really, really black, which you know can look super cool in a black and white photo, that almost black sky in there. And once again, well, there's a crazy amount of texture and structure coming through. Again, just running through these and seeing what's in here can give you some interesting ideas. Like this, okay, cool tones, this one's called. Personally, I'm very, very rarely a fan of adding color into black and white adding a sepia or a cyan wash or anything like that. But for some images, it really works. And I actually kind of like this here. It's subtle. It's a very subtle, cool tone, but I dig it. I mean, at least on my screen, this looks pretty cool. So you know, something to consider. And you got like the sepia ones. Again, sepia stuff is really not my thing, but if that's what you're going for, then you certainly have the tools to do it in here. You can do these like ancient antique looking things. It doesn't really make sense having this antique photo of this super modern building skyline, but you know, hey, if that's what you want to do, you can do it. So lots of different ideas in here, but let, let's just go back to the top and let's start this thing from scratch. So again, the real power here, what I want to play with is in the sensitivity sliders here. And remember from the original photo, in fact, if I move this, yeah, we can see it. We have these oranges and blues and the yellows in the building. These are our prominent colors. And so what that tells me is those are the prominent sliders that I should be playing with. So if I take my red slider 
and I darken that or brighten that. Notice the red tones from the original image and how they're getting brighter and darker in here. So again, if we go back to the color one, the reddest tones that we have here are right here on the horizon. So right there, kind of just as the sun's setting there. So if I go back to the black and white version and I take this, this red slider and I drag that to the left, it makes that red tones darker. You can see how that's just gotten very, very dark there. If I go the opposite direction, it makes it brighter to the point where it actually matches the tonality of the sky above it. So really interesting, right? By looking at your color image, you can think, okay, I wanna make the reds brighter. I wanna make the yellows darker. I wanna make the blues, I don't know, darker, right? You can choose those, make those decisions based off the colors of the original image. So in this case, I certainly don't wanna make them uh, brighter. I think what I'll do is take those reds a little bit darker, get a little bit more emphasis into that skyline there. I'm not gonna go too crazy. The blue sky, I know I've got that dark blue up there, so let's take the blue and see what happens if I make this darker, and sure enough, check that out, really pulls that sky down. There's gonna be bleed between the different color ranges, so maybe cyan is in the sky a little bit. Yep, yeah, a little bit, pull some of that down. The buildings in here had all those lights on them, they're quite warm, so we're gonna go for, I'm gonna call it kind of a yellow color, and let's see what happens there. So if I take the yellow and pull that up, now I can brighten up the yellows or darken those down, but see what happens here. If I brighten up the yellows, darken the blue way down, look at all that beautiful contrast we've introduced by simply making the, um, by simply making the colors, the original colors match the tones of the new colors, if that makes, uh, if that makes sense. Just by playing with these color sliders here, you are darkening or brightening those particular colors in the black and white version, which is just, really neat. And again, you really can make that stand out and, and look super beautiful in there. Let's say that I wanted to do a darker tone across the top, bring the whole thing kind of uh, vignetting, but I don't want to vignette all the sides and the edges here. It's really just the top that I want to focus on. So I'm going to go to my finishing tools, finishing adjustments. And I have this thing called burn edges, and I'm going to focus on the top. And I'll start by making this really, really big. I'll just do a huge grab that strength slider and drag it way up. And you can see you get this thin dark line across the top there. I can change the size of that. Um, I can change the transition of it. So make that a bigger or smaller transition point. And what I wanna do is probably, I wanna make it too big, probably something kind of like that and then take the strength down. The reason that I will often take the strength all the way up on something like this or even a vignette to start with is just so I have total visibility of what I'm doing. When I drag this slider all the way up, I can see exactly where that size is, what the transition effect is having on it. Whereas if I was, if I started like down here with a low strength and I was adjusting these, it's a little bit harder to know exactly what you're doing. So that's why I like to take this all the way up, move the sliders to where I want them to be, and we're gonna go pretty you know, pretty soft on there, I think. Let's pull the size up a little bit and then back down on the strength to get it down to where I want it to. So that way I've got that kind of darker, larger vignette over the whole thing. And of course I can continue to, to build on that if I wanted to. Um, there's a question that's come up I'm actually gonna do right now where someone's asking if I could brighten this up to make it match the rest of the sky. So let's see how well we can do that. I don't know if we'll get it all the way up, but let's see what happens. Let's get rid of the burned vignette edge, um, take that down. And let's go for selective adjustments and I'm gonna drop a control point up. In this top corner here, make that a little bit bigger and then brighten it up a little bit. And let's see, find the, Actually, it's pretty good right there. It's probably a little too small to make that a little bit bigger. And yeah, there we go. All right, that kind of works. Looks like there's a little bit of a dark spot here. So let me add another control point onto here. Brighten that up as well. Make that a little smaller. Move it over a touch. Try to find just the right spot for that. Brighten it up a little bit. Yeah, there we go. So if you wanted to do that, you could. There you go. That works. And that works pretty well. Skies are... You know, very rarely are they totally uniform, so that's something to consider. You don't want to make it look too uniform or it won't look real. But if I wanted to continue out that thought process and darken this to go with, let's do that. Let's see if we can do it. So I'll take this, make that a little bit darker. And we're getting a little bit of, of I can see kind of the separation of the d zones in here. So maybe I'll make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, there we go. I mean, that's pretty uniform. This is still a bit brighter here. 
pretty uniform, but that's something you could definitely do if that's what you wanted to do. Yeah, that works. But for my money, delete, delete, delete. I like that dark corner in there. I think that really adds some emphasis to it that I quite like. So I think I would, I think I would leave that as it is there. Uh, for the final touch, I might want to play with grain. I personally love a bit of grain into my photos. Now, if you're going to play with grain, you definitely want to zoom into 100% to do it. If you aren't at 100%, you aren't going to truly see what your grain looks like. Now, this image looks like I have, because of the way I've sharpened it and enhanced it and so on, I have brought forward some of the the noise. We're not going to call it grain. We're going to call it the noise of the base image. And I kind of want to hide that. I want to add grain on top of that so you see it as grain, not as noise. Now, some will argue, what's the difference? But there's just a difference in the pattern. And to me, I can tell that this looks like noise, whereas what I want is grain. So I'm going to go back into my film types and play with the grain slider. Grain is set, uh, the slider is a grain per pixel count which starts at the top, which is a little bit counterintuitive until you really think about what it's saying. Grain per pixel, how many grains of grain per pixel would there be? By taking it up to 500, that is the maximum that is effectively saying that there is no visible grain. The grain is so small that you can't see it. As I drag this down to fewer grains per pixel, we end up with larger and larger or more and more visible grain elements in there. So that's how that works. That's why that one starts the opposite direction than you would normally think. So I would bring this down to a point where it obfuscates the grain or rather the noise that's in there, which might be right about there or so. I can play with the softness of that um, or actually let's make it a little bit even grainier on there just to add a little bit of that grain in. And then we end up with something that looks like a grainy black and white photo as opposed to a noisy high ISO photo. So that's kind of cool. I dig that. I really like playing with the grain for that. So that's where I would use something like that. All righty, let's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and apply that and turn the camera back on for a moment. And let's jump over to the questions. I see there is a question here. It says, before converting to black and white, do you try to tune the values in the color image to match the zone system? Interesting. Um, interesting question. No, I wouldn't do that before. My What I would do is send over, and this is not a great example image for that because there's so much shadow detail, but just imagine a photo that's a little bit more standard with more normal tonal range from dark to light. I would just want to ensure that I had all that data intact going into the filter, um, that I hadn't crushed my blacks or blown out the highlights before bringing it in. And then once I've got that clean data in um, uh, SilverFX Pro, then I would go ahead and look at the zone system and start following the zone system to try and get a particular level to a particular zone. If you're not familiar with the zone system, for those who are listening and going, well, what are you talking about? The zone system refers to Ansel Adams zone system where he defined every shade in 11 steps from zero to 10, where the darkest dark was zero, the brightest specular highlight was 10, and everything falls somewhere in between. So every tone in black and white photography should match a particular tone in there. Now, that's a kind of a correct way to look at it. And then obviously you can get creative and push things brighter or darker. But if you are doing things like uh, portrait photography, making sure that skin falls into a particular zone that your um, say you've got a snow, like a portrait in the snow, you've got snow and making sure that the white snow falls into the right zone will ensure that not only does it look good on screen, but more importantly, that when you print it, it prints very accurately and looks really, really clean. I've done entire webinars on the zone system. So I encourage you to check that out. Again, photojoseph.com slash DXO, scroll down, you'll see all the webinars in there. Just look for the one that's called either zone system or Ansel Adams or something along those lines. So definitely check that out. Okay, we have one more photo. Let's see here, uh, this one. All right, so this photo, kind of a fun story here. This is shot in Taipei. This is, if we zoom in close, you'll see it's a, it looks a little bit soft. It's like a little bit of a kind of a blooming thing going on in here. And you're thinking, what did you do to your lens, man? Well, this is actually a vintage lens. It was adapted for a full frame camera. And the softness and the blooming that you're seeing in there is actually inherent in the glass. And I, well, clearly I love that or I wouldn't have been shooting with it, but this is something that I really enjoy. I really enjoy shooting with old vintage glass and and um, really kind of leaning into the characteristics of those lenses, especially for video, really cool for video. Anyway, for this particular photo, I'm going to 
again, lean into that and take that older vintage film look even farther. So what I do have from this lens is the blooming in here, that softness and the blooming around the highlights that would be quite difficult to reproduce or to recreate digitally. That um, glamour glow would definitely do some of it, but you know, there's just no replacement for an actual original analog effect. So, um, oh, I guess I'll just turn that off. Um, so that looks great. That's great in here, but the colors in here are a little bit too clean, a little bit too modern. So that's the, the area that I want to play with is the color work. Um, possibly some other stuff as well, but let's start by just doing a little bit of basic enhancement. I talked earlier about as a starting point, grabbing the exposure slider, dragging that up and down. Another common starting point for me is just to click the auto button and see what that does. And in here, when I click auto, it actually kind of flattens out the file a little bit. It brings up quite a bit of shadow detail in here that frankly, I don't want. So I'm just going to undo that and we're not going to do the auto, but I do want to bring up a little bit more detail in the shadows down here. So let's just try taking the curves up a little bit in here. Not too much, but bring them up a little bit just to bring those midtones up. Let's kind of protect those highlights, just bring up the shadows. And I think that works. I think that's pretty good. That's it. That's all. Just a little bit and toggle that on and off. Very minor adjustment. But from here, I'm going to take this over to Analog Effects Pro. So right click on there and choose Edit in Analog Effects Pro. Analog Effects is all about those, as you might guess from the name, analog or kind of old, old world film looks to them. Now, analog effects is really a playground. This is a great fun tool to just play with and see what you can get out of it. This photo, again, already has a film look to it. So any kind of filmy color effect that I add to it is just going to enhance that. It's just going to take it to the next level, which is really kind of fun. So I'm just going to go through a few of these classic camera presets and see how these look. And like this one has a very kind of undersaturated film look, definitely looks quite realistic in there. Um, let's see here, what else we got in here? Look, it's classic camera five. I actually quite like the classic camera one. That one's a little bit too saturated. Classic seven looks pretty good in there. So anyways, this is really lifted blacks, really quite washed out. So we gotta be careful of that one. That's a little bit too much in there. Um, let's see, there's also some vintage ones. These are classic camera presets. Let's go for some vintage presets and see what we get in here. And here we're getting some borders added on as well. And of course, anything that you don't like in here, you can alter. So let's just say that I really like this look. I don't, but let's just pretend that I did, but I don't like the border on there. So I'll go through the adjustments here and find out where that border is coming from. There's this thing called frames. And if I look at that, we can see, yep, that's it. Turn that off. And now that whole weird border thing goes away. Okay, cool. That's better. So then I just keep going through these, find one that I like. And there is one here that I actually really like, this vintage camera four. It has really kind of overdone that blurring around the top there. So it's very much like a, almost like a pinhole camera where we are blurring severely the edges in there. There's a light wash across the front of that, which again, if you don't like that, you can figure out where that is. And it's coming from the light leaks and change that. And really just come up with a very cool look in here. So this is neat. This is a fun way to go. I, I'm digging the way this goes, but let's, um, Let's do this from scratch instead. Let's go for a film look from scratch. So I'm going to cancel this and I'm going to open this up now in Color Effects Pro 4 instead. And the reason I'm going to go here specifically is because there is a film filter in here that I really, really like for doing color film work. And you'll find in here, let's go there, let's get rid of this levels and curves. If we look on here we go film under f for film film effects is a series of them faded modern nostalgic and vintage the one that i like is this modern one called modern branded and it's called branded because if you look over here you'll see that there are actual recognizable film stocks so very similar to working in um uh, in uh, silver effects pro you have those known film stocks that have been recreated in here and then you can go through and you can find one that you like and there's the newest ones up at the top, which is the ones that we typically go to whenever I'm kind of showing something off in here. But I actually really like a good old classic Kodak Gold. So I'm gonna drop down to this one, Kodak Gold 100. Now here it has amplified the oranges a little bit too much, I think. So um, if I wanted to refine that, I could go in here and certainly do that. Maybe what I'll do is take a control point and drop a control point on that orange in there. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take that back. That's not how I'm gonna do this. I'm going to add a 
saturation filter to this. That's what I wanted to do. So let's go into brilliance and warmth. There it is. And pull some of the saturation out of that. There we go. Let's pull that down, down, down a little bit. Um, and I'm right now I'm looking at the orange in here, but as I'm pulling that down, the rest of the image is, as you would expect, getting undersaturated as well, which I don't want to do. It's just the orange that I wanted to desaturate. So I'm going to pull that down. And then now is where I wanted to add that control point, drop that onto the orange so that I am just desaturating the orange part of the image there. And as before, if you want to see what that looks like, we can enable the mask and you can see exactly the part of the image that's being affected in there. And so now as I do my saturation adjustment, you can see quite clearly there it is only affecting that part of the image. And I would pull that down to the level that I want. Another approach to this though, might be Viveza. So let's do this. Let's close this off. I'm gonna put that orange back in, hit save. And then I'm gonna take this into Viveza and see what we can do in there. So same photo, edit in Viveza, which is going to give me, let's, uh, we're gonna go ahead and edit the original at this point, which is going to give me that finite control over individual colors in there. So let's go ahead and fire this guy up, make that nice and big. And in Viveza, this is definitely one of the older filters in here, but you'll notice there are no filters to pull from. There's no individual adjustments uh, that you grab over. Everything is done through control points in here. So I would go in and add a control point to that orange on there. Let's make that a bit smaller. And what do I want to adjust on there? Here's all my adjustments, brightness, contrast, saturation, structure, and so on. And in this case, I'll take that saturation and pull that down a little bit. Maybe I wanna add a little kiss of warmth onto his face. Let's add another control point onto his face in there, make that quite small and drop that into place. Let's take a look at that. So there you can see it's just adjusting his face and I'll take the warmth and add a little bit of warmth into that. There we go. It's nice, makes him look a little bit more healthy, a little bit warmer in there, looking good. And let's see here, anything else I wanna do? Actually, no, kinda of like that. Pull the orange down, pull the face up a little bit, hit OK, and away we go. And so that's how you would use Viveza in this. So Viveza, again, is very, very specific, very unique. You want to bring in a adjustment to a very precise part of the image. Viveza is a great way to do that. All right, with that said, let's jump back into the question, see if there's anything else in here, and then we are going to wrap it up. Uh, let's see here. Do you recommend going to curves first rather than the adjustment sliders for highlights, whites, blacks, and shadows? That is very much a personal preference. I, I like curves. I like the way that I, um, the image looks with curves. I like the control that I have. Sometimes I will go into curves because that's kind of my personal go-to and I'll have a hard time getting what I want and then I'll go final. Just use shadows and highlights because I probably have a little bit more easier control, but I I just I just really like working with curves. I think it's just because I've worked with it for so, so long that it's just something that I really kind of really gravitate towards. I mean, you know, we're going back to like Photoshop 1.0 days where you didn't have all those separate sliders. It was all curves. I just learned to control the image that way. So that's often the way I do it. Also, the other thing I like about curves is that I can go into a color curve. So an individual channel like the red channel here. And if I wanted to like say cool down, add a little bit of blue into the shadows on there, um, I could do something like that, or let's go into the greens and add a little green into the highlights. You know, I can do these changes, these color effects in curves without going into filters. So that's something that I will often do as well, especially if I'm trying to go for kind of a, a vintagey look. Next question, how would you use Silver Effects Pro to achieve specific soft silver tones? Um, again, so I don't know why I said again. Um, <laughs> with Silver FX Pro, so silver is not a color, right? Silver is just a, an illusion, if you will, of no color, it's black and white, but with certain highlights, certain bright areas that are going to, I would say, have a, a higher ramp up to a bright spot, so it looks shiny. If you think about silver being something that's shiny, anything where there's a highlight, it's going to very quickly ramp up. Think about like a chrome bumper, right? It's normal silver and then suddenly it's completely blown out because it's so shiny. So I would be looking for the brighter parts of the image to amplify those, to over-exaggerate those so that the ramp from gray to white goes up a bit steeper and it's gonna give that, that um, brighter look on there that'll give it kind of that silver toned look. Uh, 
probably add a bit more contrast in the midtones as well that would add some texture into those midtones to again separate out the bright the brightest parts and the darker parts of the image that would be my first thing to go to my first suggestion there are actual kind of silver presets in silver effects pro so you could go in and play with those to start with and um, and adjust from there but yeah that would be my my neat immediate reaction of how i would get there okay that is i believe it for the questions um thank you so much for tuning in today there are more webinars coming uh, again photojustup.com slash dxo or get dxo that will take you there and from there you can see what um what's on the roster and check out all the old webinars as well thanks again everybody hope you enjoyed that today appreciate you tuning in and we'll see you next time Bye. -bye.